again to you, Rock Hill. My name is Michael. I have the opportunity to serve as lead pastor here. We're glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. We're delighted if you can grab your Bibles to open them up or open your apps to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. We're beginning a new year and it's fitting that I think if you know where you want to end up, you'll know how you ought to begin. And so we're beginning a series here in January with vision. I think it's imperative that in the beginning of a year, it's always helpful for a church to revisit why we exist, why we do what we do and the reasons for it. And so we're beginning a series that will take us all the way through January that will help us clarify what our mission is, what our vision is, and how we want to go about it, aka our strategy. And so to think about that as you're turning, I, I want you to get in mind a picture of a map and a picture of a menu. Now, you know what a map is. A map is one of those things you use to help you get from point A to point B. And when I was in college, I had, this is before GPS, this is before cell phones that could do this. I, I had a laminated Texas map, had all the highways on it, and I would lay it out and I would figure out the course for me to get from point A to point B and going to school in Brownwood meant that I had to take a lot of weird back roads and where deer roam in abundance. And so we were always trying to figure out the best way to go and I would actually write it down on a little card and that was my GPS device. I would put it on my dashboard and boy, I was cutting edge and I would just follow that, those numbers all the way through. You understand what a map does. A map helps you, you know where you're going and you follow that route in order to achieve your mission. But then think about a menu. Now, when you go to a restaurant, there are menus. Now, I'm thankful for those restaurants that provide pictures of what they're about to serve you. Now, in part, I can say, well, it's supposed to look like this, but it doesn't look like this. Or sometimes it helps me know, well, that looks good, so it hopefully will be good. Uh, menus are helpful, but menus are for us when we kind of pick and choose that which we want to eat. Now, some of us are creatures of habit. We go to a restaurant and we're gonna order the same thing every time. Uh, some of us, uh, we base what we order on how we're feeling. I'm feeling like a salad, which is rare. I'm feeling like a steak, which is often. I mean, so there's just these different feelings we have and we'll base what we select on maybe how we're feeling or how it's presented and so on and so forth. Now, I'm sharing that with you because I think it can give us a snapshot of the church. I want Rock Hill to be a map, not a menu. What I mean by that? Well, a menu in churches often is one of those things where the church will share with you the variety of options they present and you kind of, based on how you're feeling, picking and choosing or selecting or deselecting that which caters to your preferences. This is what I like, this is what I'm going to do. Now, there's nothing wrong with having events or having programs. They are necessary to help you. However, those programs and events should be leading you on a pathway of the mission of where we want to go. So at Rock Hill, we don't want to have events simply to have events. We don't want to have programs just to have programs. We want them to be meaningful. I think about church and I want it to be a map. This is the direction we want to go. This is the, the way in which we want to, to be. This is where we want to end up. And so to have a mission of where we're headed then helps clarify our vision. The vision is that next step as to where you're going. If we can just define those terms, you know, mission is the destination. This is where I want to end up. The vision is maybe the first stop among many stops. And if you're like me and my family with three daughters and a dog, there are often multiple stops along the journey. We're just outside of Henderson County and they'll say, I have to go to the restroom. And you're thinking, we literally just left. But you can imagine that anytime you're going from point A to point B, you, you might have multiple stops. And that's what vision does. Vision helps clarify what's our next step. But then you gotta have a strategy. Strategy helps clarify and define that which you're going to do to accomplish the vision and accomplish the mission. Now I wanna be clear. Every church is going somewhere. Every church is defined in some way. But in my experience, and I know I'm limited to my own experience, most churches are not clear with where they're going and they're ambiguous about who they're trying to be. I don't want Rock Hill to be ambiguous and I don't want Rock Hill to be muddy in regards to who 
we are trying to be and where we are headed. So I think Matthew 28 is going to show us what our mission should be. We want to help people who are far from God become followers of Jesus. I just think that's simply what the Great Commission is. It's explaining the gospel to people who are missing out on his very best. I've shared that with you multiple times without maybe you've even now realized that I've said that before, but I want that for us to be where we're headed. We want to help people far from God become followers of Jesus. We've said it multiple weeks simply because we're trying to get the mission in your mind. The reason why we gather is so that we can help everybody get closer in following Jesus. We don't want to grow our church by grabbing them necessarily from other churches. We want to help people who are missing out on God's very best because we believe that God wants us to be a great commission church. Now vision, now I wanna be careful here. I'm not wanting Rock Hill to be big just to be big. Sure, I'm wanting us to grow, of course I want us to grow, but I want you to know that I'm wanting us to understand the way in which I want us to grow. And to do that, I have to define some terms or maybe just one term for you. Anytime there's an election or anytime there's a census done, there's a little box that you can check and it identifies where you land maybe within your religion. There's evangelical, there's a mainline Protestant evangelical, uh, there's Catholic, and then there's another category among the other categories, and it's this one selection called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. The nuns are simply this, they are religiously unaffiliated. What they've done is that on that list of options, they'll select none of the above. So they're just saying outright, we claim no category, which becomes its own category of religious affiliation. Now you and I both know that just because somebody claims a religious particular affiliation does not mean that they're actually a follower of Jesus, but at least we have some type of ground rules to understand, hey, this is the group of people that are in this category. And so I have said to the staff, I've I've said it from day one with them and, and they're probably tired of me saying it, but I've just said this simply, our data drives our decisions. Data drives decisions. What do I mean by that? Well, if I go to the doctor and he tells me a diagnosis, I'm gonna want the data on what the next steps are. I don't wanna just hear that I'm sick. I wanna know, well, what kind of sickness? Is it a stomach bug? Is it the flu? Or is it something else? I I wanna know the details behind it because whatever that data is, is going to determine, right, the solution. So when I began to do some research, I just said, well, what does it look like nationwide? And then we'll kind of zero in just to our own county. Nationwide, in 1990, the nuns made up 8.1%. That's 1990, some of you weren't even born yet, but in 1990, 8.1% is what made up of those who selected none of the above above when it came to religious affiliation. In 2008, that number jumped to 15%. So you can see this kind of a progression. Then when I I looked at even more recent data, it it became a little bit more ambiguous because it said, well, here's the range of which we we found some studies said this and some studies said this. In 2018, it says anywhere from 23 to 31.4% on average. Now, if you say on average, there are some that are below that and there's some that are gonna be above that. So then I said, okay, now let's get personal because that's, that's fine, it's the United States of America, that's prim- my, you know, primarily probably the East and West Coast, right? The East and West Coast, those guys, yeah, those on the fringes, but us here in the Bible Belt, oh, we're gonna be way lower than that. So I said, well, what about Smith County? Because obviously they're our neighbors and we care about them. They sit at 33%. 33% in Smith County, that's about 60,000 people claim to have no religious affiliation. That's where they're at. And I said, okay, now let's get real personal and let's look at Henderson County. Henderson County is at 49%. 49% of our county has declared publicly on a stat that the government uses, that that data is available online, it's free, are claiming no religious affiliation. That makes up about 39% thousand people that if Jesus returned tonight would die and spend an eternity in separation from God. 
Think about that. 49%. Almost half of everybody you meet in Henderson County is far from God that we want to be about helping become followers of Jesus. So here's how I want to frame our vision, our next step. And this, this isn't overnight, and this isn't something that happens tomorrow, and it's not something that, happen, that may even happen in a year, but I'm just asking us to be about this. Our vision would simply be this. We want to reach 1% of the nuns. We just want to see 1% of that 49% come to faith in Jesus Christ. We wanna be conduits of God's blessing and grace to say we're going to share the gospel with those around us because people matter to God. So the vision is simply that. We wanna reach 1% of those nuns. It's why, it's why you now may understand starting next week we're shifting our weekend schedule We're shifting our weekend schedule because studies tell us that most people who are maybe even curious about God would come most often between the hours of nine and 11. And so by shifting our weekend schedule to an eight o'clock service, a 9.30 service and an 11 o'clock service. So this service is now kind of, you have two options. You can go at 9.30 or 11. We're hoping that God might be able to use that. There's no guarantee that he will, but that God might be able to use it to help us see people who are far from God become followers of Jesus. Now we think this feeds right into what the Great Commission is. And so then we have to say, well, how are we gonna do that? Well, over the next three weeks, all the way through the end of January, we're gonna talk about the strategy by which we think God might use us to make this happen, this vision a reality. Simply put, we wanna declare the gospel. We're gonna start a series in February called Beautiful Feet. Why? Well, how beautiful are the feet of those who do what? Bring good news. We think the primary job of the church is to make known the gospel. I had a professor say, and I'm paraphrasing, it's hard to share Jesus with a zipped lip. So may our lives but also our lips be declaring the gospel. We want to disciple the believer. Part of why we are changing our weekend schedule is to encourage you to be part of a group. Particularly, we think on Sunday mornings, it's a great opportunity for you to get good teaching, good community and fellowship so that you can hear the gospel in fresh and exciting ways. And then we want to send you out. We want to deploy the church. We want to be a church that is encouraging you in a prayerful way to see everyone you meet as a person and an opportunity that God has invited you to share the gospel with. So how do we do it? Well, I I want us to get to our text this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28. And I think you're going to see these elements that I've just shared with you within this text. So if you're at Matthew 28... I'm gonna be starting in verse 18. We'll put it on the screen for you as well. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. But if you're there, will you say word? Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of what? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The first thing we see in this text simply is that Jesus holds the authority. Jesus holds the authority. Now listen, he's saying this to the 12 or to the disciples here. And I'm just sharing this with you to say, I don't think Jesus has to do much convincing that he holds the authority. They have walked with Jesus for some time. Jesus has worked miracles. Jesus has healed people. Jesus has raised some or resuscitated some people from the dead. Jesus has gone to the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was buried in a tomb. And then lo and behold, Jesus came out of the tomb. So I don't think that Jesus is struggling here to figure out, to tell them and convince them, I have authority. But I think Jesus is saying, I have authority so that we can understand that he has the authority. He's making a statement of authority because he's about to command or demand something from them. 
He's about to say, because I hold the authority, this is what you're supposed to be about. Because I have the authority, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And so what does he say? He says, go. Now, in this text, there's only one command. There's only one command in this text, and it is not go. Craig Bloomberg so eloquently shares this. He says, we often have this idea of overemphasizing the word go, or we underemphasize it or de-emphasize the word go. Now, in the literal sense, this word go is to be translated as you go. So as you're going, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, that's, this is what you need to be doing. So how do we overemphasize it? When I worked with college students in Waco, Texas, I made this bold pronouncement that before anybody gets married, they should go on an overseas mission trip. That was just my pronouncement. And being young and idealistic, uh, just as they were, some of them took me up on that offer. We had one young man who's now a pastor in Arizona. He literally went to Egypt for the entire summer, came back that first Sunday of the semester. He saw a young lady across the room and said, I'm gonna marry that girl. And he came to me and made this bold pronouncement. I said, I didn't mean for you to do that literally, like go and then the next Sunday you're gonna find her. Well, they're married, they got kids and he's a pastor, praise God. But here's how we'll often overemphasize it. Think about it pragmatically. If every one of us sold everything we have in an effort to move overseas to go on mission, we would be high-fiving other Christians from other countries as they're selling everything and coming to America to do missions. So pragmatically, we can overemphasize it and put too much pressure on us to go. Now, do I think you should go on a mission trip, maybe even overseas or local? Yeah, I think that's a good thing. Now, here's how we de-emphasize it. To give a picture of this, I think about the young man, William Carey. Some of you know who William Carey is. He was not a very tall man. He was a, he was a cobbler. He worked on shoes. He was um, a man who felt compelled by God to go overseas to India on missions. So he goes to the Baptist Missionary Board of that time and he shares with them his burden for the lost in India. And I'm paraphrasing here, but this is what they said to him. If God wants to save the heathen, he won't use us to do it. Now look, I disagree with that statement. In part, they made that statement because they believed that this charge from Jesus to the disciples was only to these disciples and that it did not have any bearing on the church in that day. Now, I disagree totally with that statement. However, while you and I may disagree with that statement, some of us practice that statement because we aren't sharing the good news of the gospel with anyone that we've come in contact with. We're not burdened for the lost. We're not praying for those who are far from God. We're just going about our business, expecting others to serve us in our way in which we go. I tell you all that because for going, what does it mean for us? Going certainly may mean that you need to go to the meeting right after this service and hear about how you can participate in what God is already doing in Malawi. That certainly may be for you. We've made that available. For some, it may mean that you re-understand what and why you go to Brookshire's, that God is sending you out on mission to see others come to know you, that God is asking you and inviting you to participate in what he's already doing. If 49% of our county does not know Jesus, then we ought to be the church that is leading the charge to make known and declare the gospel to all those we come in contact with. That's why in the next few weeks, we're gonna share even more opportunities for you to be involved in missions. And it doesn't involve you getting on a plane and flying for many hours. Why do we do that? Again, people matter to God. And if our mission is to help people who are far from God become followers of Jesus, we gotta know who holds all the authority in the, in the first place. And that is him. But secondly, Jesus commands something. Jesus commands to make disciples. Now, when you're reading the New Testament, I like to do this in my, my Bible. I like to circle the commands. They just help me remember the point of the passage. And in this passage, 
There's not a bunch of commands. There's one command. It's an imperative. An imperative is something that is an expressed uh, action that is, or an expresses a command that is to be carried out or performed by those who hear. An imperative, an, if, is, an imperative is an expression of a command that is to be performed or carried out by those who hear. It's a direction, it's a command, it's even maybe a demand. And here he says very clearly what we're supposed to be doing when we go. We are to make disciples. That's what we're supposed to do. It's why every church should carry this mission. The mission of every church should be to make disciples. In fact, if you read the Bible, you'll find that the word disciple is used 261 times in the Bible. You just go through and you can just do a word search and there it is, 261 times. 231 times, it's found in the Gospels. The other times, it's found in Acts. The word Christian is used three times in the New Testament. It's in Acts 11, Acts 26, and 1 Peter 4. Now, I'm not gonna go on a campaign on social media and say we don't need to call each other Christians anymore, but we should call each other disciples. I'm not gonna do that. But I'm just saying, disciple is what we are to be known as. Well, what's a disciple? I'm glad you asked. A disciple, in a general sense, is somebody who learns something from someone else and follows their teaching. That's a general sense of what a disciple is. Well, what about a biblical disciple? A disciple of of Jesus is somebody who is actively following Jesus in their life, pursuing him and becoming more like him. So we want at Rock Hill to make disciples of Jesus. We want people from all over our county and the surrounding counties to be encountered with this gospel message because when they come in contact with the gospel, they will see the beauty and the loveliness of Jesus Christ and what he has done for them and they will respond and say, I want him in my life. So we have to declare the gospel and we have to disciple the believer. A disciple of Jesus is someone who first and foremost has a personal relationship with Jesus. That's somebody who just, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus without knowing him in a personal way. It's why Jesus is sending these disciples out to make disciples. In fact, in Philippians 2, 1, Paul will say that when you follow Jesus, you become united with Christ. He'll say in John 3 that to be a Christian means that you are born again. And so we want to be a church that is born again. And who, who are we supposed to make disciples of? Notice, he says, of all nations. Everyone, everywhere. I don't want us just to be focused in Malawi and I don't want us just to be focused in Henderson County or Smith County and the surrounding counties. I want us to say, we wanna be a church for all the nations. And what do we do? We baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and then we teach them to observe everything that he commanded them to do. Baptizing, baptizing and teaching is something that matters much to this church. To be baptized is a post conversion by immersion symbolic statement of your faith we don't baptize you if you don't know Christ we don't baptize you as a young baby we don't do that why not because we think that's evil and wicked but every time you read baptism in the new testament it's always somebody who it's after they've chosen to follow Jesus they then follow in obedience to that by way of baptism in the same way, it's, it's by immersion. That's simply what the word means. The word means literally to be dipped. So John wasn't John the Baptist. He was John the Dipper. <laughs> but we want to be about that way, of, that mode of baptism. And I'm not negating whatever mode that you've been baptized by. I'm just saying at Rock Hill, this is going to be a distinctive for us. It's what makes us Baptist. But then also it's symbolic. I will share with those who are getting baptized that if I take my wedding ring off, it doesn't make me unmarried. Why? Because the wedding ring is just a symbol to show everyone else that I've made a covenant with someone else that I'm gonna be married to them and them alone. 
So baptism is post-conversion by immersion as symbolic of your statement of faith. But we also wanna teach. We wanna be a church that helps equip teachers to teach well the good news of the gospel. When I worked with college students, I had a young man come to me and say, can you please stop talking about the gospel and about Jesus? We wanna move on to deeper things. And I said, we've not even gotten, gotten even close to the depth and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We wanna be a church that does well at discipling believers that, have, that can understand how to teach well the good news of the gospel. But lastly, notice that Jesus is with the church that makes disciples. Look at verse 20. He says, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded and remember I am with you always to the ends of the earth or the end of the age. Jesus is with the church that makes disciples. Now listen here, I'm not saying that Jesus isn't with other churches that are not on mission with him. I'm just saying that I think we could even see biblically that Jesus is particularly with churches that are about making disciples. Prove your point. Here's my point. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus will send out the 72 disciples. That means his, his reach had increased. Jesus sent them out. And what's interesting is they come back with two things. Number one, they come back with joy. It's very rare that someone goes on an international trip and they come back just angry and mad and frustrated at the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's just rare. It can happen, it just isn't the norm. I cannot wait to hear stories from David and the team when they return about how God had moved among them and how God was at work and how he did the impossible. Even when things have been really hard on a mission trip, joy permeates those who have sent and have returned. It's amazing. But then secondly, they make this other statement. They say they had the authority that even the demons submitted to them in Jesus's name. That's the two things. Is that the demons submitted to these disciples in the name of Jesus. What's their, what are they saying there? They're saying the authority of Jesus was with us. He says, I'm with you always. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, the authority that I already have, that I've claimed to have from heaven, that's been given to me from heaven to earth, I'm just saying to you now, that authority is going to be with you because I am with you. I've not been here long. But when I think about Rock Hill and the growth she's seen over the last six, seven years, I want you to know there is no way a sermon series caused that. There's no pastor who is smart enough to create that kind of growth. There's no staff strong enough and skilled enough and witty enough in order to make it possible to create a strategy. There's no, there's no book that you can read to say, if I just followed this book and this is what's gonna happen, there's not enough great minds even in this room to muster up the, the thoughts on how we can reach this 1% of the nuns. I'm just telling you, Rock Hill, it is only by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that creates the growth like that at Rock Hill. And it's my conviction that God blesses those churches that are saying we're gonna be about the mission of making disciples, helping people who are far from God to become followers of Jesus. So we're actually inviting you to participate with us to see that 1% put a dent in it, to, to see us find those who are missing from the kingdom of God, reaching them with the good news of the gospel and sharing them with this truth so that they may receive. And to close, I think about the life of Jesus. You know, Jesus was a walker. And you say, well, yeah, he had to walk because he didn't have a, a car, he didn't have Uber, he didn't have a private limo or a jet. Of course, Jesus walked, but when he called his disciples, he didn't call them and say, 
hey, we got all these options. We got preaching, we got teaching, we got community, we got uh, some groups, we got communion, we got exorcism, we got healing. We got all these options and I hope to see you next week. He didn't do that. When Jesus goes to the disciples, he says, come and follow me. And what does he do? He walks with them over a period of years and then empowers them and deploys them out as the church. It's a map, not a menu. Jesus gives the pathway. He's our source and our pattern for our future. At Rock Hill, we wanna see every believer become a disciple who makes disciples so one of the things we're working on is a pathway of discipleship. We're, we're working on that. That doesn't mean we're, we're unveiling it next week. We're just saying we're working on that as a team to discover how best we can utilize our giftings and who we are as a church so that you can be on the pathway of being the disciple. Why? Jesus is the source and the pattern for our mission. I just believe that's just what he did while he was on earth. He modeled for us what it means to be the disciple that you and I are called to be. So here's the invitation. There may be some of you in this room that have never trusted in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and today you wanna make that first step. That first step is to simply come and, and share with us your desire. We'll then share with you in a personal way the gospel message. Some of you have made that commitment, but your next step is that it's time for you to be baptized as a believer in Jesus Christ. It's just time. We'd love to have that conversation with you. For others of you, the next step is to join this church and make this your church home. But here's another way that I'm inviting you this morning. I would love for us to pray together. We have these steps in the front and you don't have to come forward to pray, but I'm inviting you that if you feel called by God to just join us in praying on how we can partner together on this vision, that you would just come and kneel and say, God, we wanna be part of what you're doing in Henderson and Smith and the surrounding counties. And so the invitation is just simply that for you today, that you just may wanna come and pray and plead with God, God, do what only you can do. Would you pray with me?